number 393 in the Believer's Hymn Book. How I praise thee, precious Savior, that thy love laid hold of me. Thou hast saved and cleansed and filled me, that I might thy channel be. We have a, a great calling, a high calling. Let's sing number 393 together. How oh, I praise thee, precious Savior, that thy love lay hold on me. Thou hast saved and cleansed and filled me, that I might thy channel be. speak to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy graciousness unto us. We thank Thee for the love of our Savior and all that He has done for us. His coming into this world on our behalf that we might have eternal life. We thank Thee that Thou has given us full provision for both life and for godliness. And we thank Thee for Thy precious Word. And we think of how it has come about unto us by Thy breathing through individuals chosen of Thyself to bring the truths to our understanding, to our, our knowledge, that we might 
have the truth of God to be presented to the unbelieving, to those that need our Savior, and the truth of God for each one who has trusted in him that we might serve thee, that we might glorify thy name and be doing according to thy precious will. So we look unto thee for thy blessing as we would open thy word tonight and that we might see more of our Savior and yet see more of, of thy provision for us as well. Now we give thee thanks and look unto thee for the blessing in our Savior's worthy name. Amen. Number 294. What's on my heart and the hymns that we're going to be singing, are, maybe you'll say they're not too related. Somebody gets a, a good hymn. I don't usually use an uh, English hymn book most of my life, so if you complain that I don't know the hymns too well, it's, um, that's the facts. Uh, 294. Thou my everlasting portion, more than life, a friend, or life to me. All along my pilgrim journey, Savior, let me walk with thee. Number 294. Thou my everlasting portion, more than friend, or life to me. All along my pilgrim journey, Savior, let me walk with Thee, close to Thee. I guess that's the wrong tune. Thank you. Thou my everlasting portion, more than friend, for life to me, all along my pilgrim journey, Savior, let me walk with thee, close to thee, close to thee, close to thee.
to be here. It's been some years since the first time I was in this hall. I can remember Brian Owen bringing me here and uh, there were lots of people and the uh, hall was new to me. But it's nice to be here again. I can hear that the, I'm easy, easily projecting my voice so I, I hope that is good for everyone to hear. What's on my heart is found in the book of Ephesians. And I would like to have gone through the book, but I will never get to where I want to get to tonight, so we're going to start at chapter 4. And I'm not going to go over too much of, of the epistle because uh, what I have will take some time as well. But we know that this epistle, uh, in chapter 1 you have it, uh, the mention, uh, verse 23, um, at the end of 22, to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. It's to do with the church, which is his body. Then it's described uh, and brought out at the concept and, and what God has wrought, his, what he's done, is found in chapter 2 when it speaks of making in himself of twain, of two, one new man. And this new man, it says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Then it's speaking of um, the habitation of God uh, through the Spirit in verse 22. Uh, this, tr these truths that are found in this epistle, it's speaking of them as the mystery. Uh, something hidden from in previous ages, but has now been made known to us. And in chapter 2, verse 20, it says, And are built, this household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So here we have the church, which is his body. In chapter 5, we have it being described. He says, I'm not really speaking about husband and wives. I'm really wanting to bring your attention to Christ and the church. And so this book is about the church, which is his body. That one new man. Now, when something new begins, there has to be provision for it. And that's what we're finding in chapter 4. The provision of God to bring about this one new man. This uh, body, uh, the church which is his body. So let's begin reading in chapter 4 and verse one. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity, it's there, uh, keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace, something we don't deserve, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. It's a gift from Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it that but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave 
some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all arrive, or all come, at the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, in the slight of men and in cunning craftiness, whereby they wait in, they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. The provision of our Savior. Now, in the section number one, as I would look at it, from chapter one to chapter two, verse 10, we find that we needed provision because we were dead. Dead in trespasses and in sins. And the provision came from the Lord Jesus Christ. He died. But not only did he die, having accomplished the work of Calvary, he was raised from the dead. We were made alive, and we were raised together with him. He was seated at the right hand of God, having accomplished the work of salvation, and we have been seated together with him. So the problem of our sin has been solved by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in this second section, and I begin it there at chapter 2, verse 11, the first section is, the mystery of God, um, as he, what he planned to do and why did he create. The mystery of God and creation, you might call it. The second part is the mystery of God and how it was coming about in time. And one new man, the two are made into one. And how can we have true unity? You have Jews who knew all about God through the revelation given in the Old Testament. And we have Gentiles who, if you look into Romans chapter 1, didn't want to retain God in their minds. Didn't want to remember him at all. Now have been presented with the truth of God and the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. How are you going to make these people one new man? God needs provision for that. And it's found, again, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's found being described in what we've just read. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. But this giving is related to what is read, uh, said here in, in verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. When did he give gifts unto men? When, when did there come this giving of gifts? How did it come about? Now, for context's sake, I would like to read in Psalm 68, verse, beginning at verse 14. Psalm 68, this is where the quotation would come from. And the Spirit brought it to the mind uh, to be written. But it's good to look into the context. Psalm 68, and we're not going to read all of the context, but of course it's regarding Israel. Verse 14. When the Almighty scattered kings in it, it was white as snow in Solomon. The hill of God is as the hill of Bashan, and high hill as the hill of Bashan. Why leap ye, ye high hills? 
This is the hill which God desireth to dwell in, the dwelling place of God. Yea, the Lord will dwell in it forever. And the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them, as in Sinai, in the holy place. <coughs> Excuse me. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast leapt captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men. Yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. So it seems that as he's writing and speaking about this one new man, and yet it's the household of God, it's the habitation of God through the Spirit, that it comes to his mind what is written in the Old Testament about a habitation. And he remembers this verse of the giving of gifts. Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men. Now you may see that there's a little bit of a difference. In the New Testament it says, Thou hast, and uh, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. This is for the provision of God's people. These gifts, other places, it's talking in a different way, but here it's the persons themselves. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. This is the purpose um, of God in, in these things. So, I, I did read the verse um, in chapter 2 and 20, but I want to read it again. And ye are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So, foundational to the church, which is his body, to this one new man, to having unity, to, as it says in chapter uh, 4 that we read, till we all arrive at the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. To have this accomplished, there has been the giving of gifts. The apostles, the prophets. Now, it says, led captivity captive and gave gifts unto man. The picture, I think you can understand and I'll bring it out. Um, maybe you've heard it many times, I don't know. But the picture is the army, the war. And as those, somebody described it as, in this way, when those Roman soldiers came to England, they put massive soldiers out there to fight them. Huge, powerful men. They're most powerful. Here's the enemy. Let us protect ourselves. And the Romans, with their ability, soon conquered them, captured them. But that wasn't the end of it. They took them back to Rome. They paraded them down the streets. They had led captivity captive. And these men were slaves. With all their power, they had been enslaved for a purpose. Where did the Lord conquer? It was there on Calvary the work was done. And the example I like to use is the Apostle Paul. And maybe we should read some verses regarding him and his character. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. <clears throat> First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 11. This is the Apostle Paul. But he was called Saul. 
And he's going to describe a little bit about himself here in these words. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, into the service, into his service, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy. So you may remember the story of the apostle. Before he got saved, he was Saul. And he was breathing out threatenings and he was determined to find every true believer. He may have asked questions like this. Um, what do you think about the Lord Jesus Christ? But he wouldn't have said it that way. What do you think about Jesus? And the person might have responded, He is Lord of all. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. If he heard that, he'd be totally infuriated. And he might ask another question. He might say, and where is he now? Expecting some to say, well, we, we did condemn him to death and, uh, and found him to be an imposter and we put him on a cross and he died. But there would have been others that said, we believe that God raised him from the dead. And when he found a person saying such, he would put them in prison, give his testimony against them, so that they would blaspheme against God if they could help that, if he could have that happen. He wanted it to happen. But as you know, one day he was going down to Damascus for that very purpose. And on his way down to Damascus, this enemy of the cross, this enemy of the Lord Jesus, this enemy of Christianity, going down there, saw a great light, fell to the ground, and said, Who art thou, Lord? He knew it was from heaven. And the answer took him captive. I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. He then realized that the one that was on the cross was there for a purpose. He would say Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Was, bar uh, was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. It was there at that moment the truth came into his heart that this Jesus is the Christ. He is Lord of all. He is the Son of God. He would say concerning himself, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When you realize that he had been an enemy, but now we see how through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord, he takes him captive. And a willing captive. He would say, I'm a debtor to preach the gospel. A debtor to bring out the truths of the word of God. He was captivated. So, as he was captivated in that way, he was captivated for men. But he was also captivated to, um, as we've read, so that God could give him unto men. Gifts for men and given to men. So Old Testament, New Testament comes together. I want to read a little bit more about him. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 8. <clears throat> the 
This is the same man being used by the Spirit of God to pen these words. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed. So he was given, the apostle was enabled and given authority and the power that he, for the edification of the people of God. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 11. I am become a fool in glory, ye have compelled me. For I ought to have been commended of you. For nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, um, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Now, I want us to think about this. The proof of being an apostle, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you. Why were signs needed? What does it mean to be an apostle? I think we can jump quickly over to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Sorry if you intended to go to sleep. I uh, keep changing passages, so I don't usually permit that. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Speaking to those who had followed him and had seen many things, uh, all that ha had taken place, as he describes later, we won't say all of that right now, we'll read it. But verse 8, first, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Ju Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Just put it in your mind for a moment. This is the authority they are being, that they are seeing. The new authority. Who is directing them? The Lord himself. He said, ye shall receive power. He's told them to stay in Jerusalem until they receive power. And then he's commissioning them. He's telling them where they're going to go and what they're going to do. Now, who can go? Well, who's an apostle? Verse 21 of the same chapter, chapter 1 of Acts, verse 21. Therefore, wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So an apostle is one that has been a witness of the resurrection. The 11, and even when they added Matthias of 12, they were men that had been with him from the very beginning. So they were witnesses of what he did in the flesh from the very time of the baptism of John until the very moment he was separated from them, received in a cloud, and went into heaven. Now, the Apostle Paul is a bit different, but he did see the risen Lord, and he would have had a quite a good knowledge of what had taken place in the Lord's life here on earth, and the Spirit of God led him into many other things. Back to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7. And I'm not going into the mystery right now. I could read more verses, and they're all lovely. But I'm thinking of the Apostle Paul in his service. Whereof, thinking of the gospel that he received, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Chapter 3, verse 7, verse 8 now. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and make 
and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. And he continues on there. Verse 11 maybe helps a little bit. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the Apostle Paul was chosen and enabled. Gift was given to him to proclaim to the Gentiles and to bring all these truths to us. Now, we, we have a little bit of a concept here then of one man who was taken by the Lord Jesus Christ in virtue of the value of his death, burial, and resurrection. He was captivated. And he was a gift that was given unto men. What does this mean? How does it affect us? Why would we need it? Why did God give gifts unto men? Well, it, it says we read um, chapter 4, till we all, are, all arrive at the unity of the faith. There's going to be opposition. There's going to be foreign doctrines. And some are children, they're infants, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. There has to be the knowledge of the truth. Now you may say, well, we have the whole Old Testament. We do. And if you want to learn about love, why not go to the Old Testament? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy might and all thy strength. And love thy neighbor as thyself. You'd learn a lot about love right there. Don't think you'd be too lacking in that subject. You might say, who's my neighbor and all that sort of thing, but you could learn if you wanted to. What did they need to know? I'd like to just kind of paint a little picture of what was happening. The Lord Jesus Christ on the night he was betrayed was not in the outer temple. He went to a secret place with just a few of his disciples and he spoke to them, this is the new covenant in my blood. This was something new. Now you can listen to his, his teaching and there's many, many new things coming in Mark's gospel. He says, don't think I'm just come to put a patch on things. And, and don't think that I, I'm just going to try to put some new wine into old bottles. No. This is new. There has to be a new authority, and that's why I, I kind of tried to emphasize that. The authority of the Old Testament, of God through Moses, this is the word of the Lord, through the high priests, as they would command and they would teach. But soon as you get into the Acts, you find there's something going on very different, because the high priests call up Peter and John, and they say, do not preach in the name of this person. And God does something very interesting. They throw them into prison. And then they come the next day with the intent of, let us now push our point on them. Let us judge them, make them fear, afraid, so that they will not preach before we let them go. And they didn't find them in the prison. What had happened? The real authority came to those apostles. God sent an angel. And the angel let them go. Not to let them go as get away, these bad people are after you. He said, go preach the gospel in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now we have a new authority. The New Testament has begun. There's a new covenant. They're not under the old covenant and all it demands. They're under a new authority. Now you're going to ask questions. What about the feasts? What do we do? How do we meet? What's going to take place? Where's our authority? What, what is it all about? 
This is all new. He gave gifts unto men. Who? Some apostles, some prophets. Who are they? The foundational people of this new unity. The church, which is his body. The foundation of the apostles and prophets. But this is coming from the risen Lord, and this is to bring to us all that we need to know. So, turn to the Old Testament, and you will, if you perceive clearly, understand that uh, the one that was born in Bethlehem was of old from, from generations. From everlasting, sorry. Yes, you might perceive that he's, he's the eternal Son of God. But in the New Testament, there was clear teaching. This Jesus whom you crucified, God hath made both Lord and Christ. He is Lord of all. And there would be coming, look in your New Testament. Now, what is the New Testament? This is really the foundation of the apostles and prophets. This is the revelation of God regarding this new item, the church which is Christ's body, this one new man, the bride of Christ, and all that pertains to it. What are they going to do? How are they going to act? The truth is found in our New Testament. How did it come? The foundation is the apostles and prophets. And they were given what God wanted us to know. Now, you may say, what do you mean by these prophets? No, don't think of the Old Testament prophets. They had their time, but in the New Testament, it is revealing the word of God to man. It's, it's not as some people think, oh, prophet, he's going to tell us what's going to happen in the future. No, it's, it's speaking the word of God. And so these, you can read in, in 1 Corinthians 14, when they gathered together, could they read Matthew? No, it wasn't written. Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Galatians, Ephesians, all of these books came much later. How could they meet? God would give them a message. But you and I would compare it to what we have and say it was only in part. They had a, what they needed for that moment, but it was only part of the full revelation. You now know in part. You understand in part. But when that which is complete, and that's referring to the Word of God, that's the fullness. So do we have apostles and prophets today? No, but we have what God gave to them in fullness here in what we call the New Testament. So it's important for us to realize where we have the, uh, the Word of God. And, and wanting just to bring out a few things. We're not going to be able to go into it. Yes, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ was spoken up. The timing... Regarding Christ coming in his glory, you find that in the early chapters as well. And he quotes the Old Testament but expounds on it. And in chapter 3 as well, he says he must be received into glory until the restitution of all things. There's going to be time. So there's what you might say, something's taking place and there's going to be a time limit for it until God continues on with the program that was very well described in the Old Testament. The whole role of the Holy Spirit. I want us to remind us of what we have in, in John's Gospel. They're told very clearly, you're not able to bear all that I will teach you. You're not able to bear it now. You're not able to understand it and comprehend it. And now some people try to say the disciples were pretty poor in there and held to old traditions and things like this, and let's not blame them. I don't have time to go into it, but there's, you know that he said to uh, Peter, when he said, thou art the Christ, the Son of God, Son of the living God, 
flesh hath not revealed on this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. I could show you another spot, and I'm not going to take time to do it. But the Lord was saying that the revelation to the people, to his disciples, was in two stages before they would actually see clearly. The first stage was a revelation from God that Jesus is the Christ. The second stage would be after he rose from the dead that he must first suffer and then will enter into his glory. These are things that had to be revealed to them. So let's not blame the, the apostles that they really weren't very godly and they should have got over these things. I believe it, each of those truths had to be revealed and they would be only revealed at the perfect timing of our Heavenly Father. So here are men. They now have a, an understanding of the resurrection. They're going to teach that. It's found only in its fullness in the New Testament. What meetings are we going to go to? What, what's going to happen? Should we be going up to Jerusalem three times a year for, or, or up to seven times a year for the feasts? No. What are they given for feasts? And how do we worship now? The Lord is, would bring back to their minds, ye shall neither worship in this mountain nor at Jerusalem, but ye shall worship in spirit and in truth. And now it would be revealed to them how they would worship and how they would remember him and show forth his death till I come, says the Lord. These would be truths that would be so astounding to them. We, we see it maybe weekly. We understand these things. This is what's been happening. But for these Jewish men that had known the old covenant, and now had revealed that there's a new covenant. They needed this gift from God that would open up their understanding. They had to have it all revealed to them. Not just revealed, but confirmed by miracles. Their authority as an apostle, that their word was really the word of God, had to be confirmed by miracles. Even the gospel had to be confirmed. Um, Hebrews chapter 2, verse, um, verse 3 is what we often know. Um, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, uh, God also bearing them witness both with signs and miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. So the gospel had to be confirmed to us. But what we read... Even the truths that they were bringing had to be confirmed. And that's why the prophet was given a gift and, and they would understand that this is from God and, and there's various other gifts. Then they knew that what they had just heard was God's inspired word. How do we know it? It's found in the New Testament. It's now revealed to us. We have this. But don't belittle it. Delve into it. We know, need to know. What other things would we do? Baptism will be taking place. You won't find it in the Old Testament. The meaning of baptism is clearly presented in the New Testament from these apostles uh, that were sent, were given unto men their gift um, for us to know. Um, the, the, the magnitude of the gospel is directed by God, no longer by the priest. So the, the difference in authority. What is holiness? The Old Testament talks about holiness and, and the people of God. You can read in cha uh, Acts chapter 8, and they're talking about the saints, and yet they didn't even know the gospel yet. And then many of them believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. So they were separated people, separated from those Gentiles and all those sinful things, and their character. Was that? the new holiness that God's expecting today. That too is revealed by the apostles. Um, true holiness is not by what we eat. It's not by just doing actions. It, there is a depth of holiness. Um, so God chose these different individuals. I, I just want you to 
think of what Peter said one day. He was in a, a, a big group of having met. It was kind of like a, a, a real conference. There were a deep, deep discussions, Acts chapter 15, and he says, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth would hear the gospel. So that again reminds us of the authority. And God chose these men and gave them to the church. Uh, yes, Peter was one of them as well. Prayer. Where will we pray? And in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John have been released. And they come to the, those that believed. And they told them all that took place. And they all gathered with one accord, with one heart. And if instead of me uh, making mistakes in statements, let me read that a little bit. Acts chapter 4. Verse 24, and when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hath made heaven and earth. And they pray. And then what happens? And now, Lord, verse 29, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done in the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Prayer meeting. Who was there? Men and women, all of them. How did they pray? I can only see that one person was actually making sound but it says they prayed with one accord, one heart. It came from them. I often describe it in Africa, and I say, now, if you went to the chief and you had something you wanted to tell the chief, and there may be 50 of you going, what are you going to do? All of you start talking at the same time? he would just say, get rid of these people. But if you have one clearly speaking, and everyone else is nodding their head beside him, or behind him, or wherever they are, the chief says, take, we'll take notice. This is a unified people with a unified request, and I better take notice. That's what God wants us all together. Gathering together so that we might pray with one heart and one mind unto God. This was new prayer meetings. You don't go back up to the temple. And as they do nowadays, leave their little prayer requests somewhere. No, this is a totally different thing. It doesn't have to be done at Jerusalem. They're not going up to the feast, but there are some important things that they'll be doing Lord's Day by Lord's Day, remembering Him, showing forth His death till He come. And there's going to be prayer meetings. And you say, well, you're almost talking about Acts chapter 2. Let's read it. Something we know well. Acts chapter 2, verse... Well, maybe we'll start at verse 40. Verses that are well known to us. Peter preaching the gospel and with many other words he did testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward, this perverse generation. Speaking of the chief priests and all that rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they, they that gladly received his word, they understood it and they knew it to be true were baptized. And the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly reading the Old Testament and finding out what the priest would tell them. Sorry. I think I misread that. Actually, I didn't read it. But we better read what it says. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. These gifts that were given to man for their edification for their understanding, so that they under, the things that couldn't have been revealed before are now, by the Spirit of God, being told them. Continuing in the apostles' doctrine 
and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. There's a new beginning, and God has done it. Done it by His power, by His might. It was the risen Christ that took that apostle and made him his slave. Willingly, he was his slave. And he would say, I'm a debtor, and gave him to the church. And how much truth have we received from the Apostle Paul? He says, I was chosen to fill up the Word of God. All that God was wanting to reveal to us, yes, we've learned from Peter, we learned from John, we learned, and they were also gifts. They were, they were gifts given unto us. And we have that. We have it recorded in the New Testament. But the Apostle Paul was used to fill up very much. And that's why we understand justification. How can I be just before God? That's how we can understand redemption and its fullness and all its meaning. That's why we know of the resurrection. That's why we know of what God is going to do in the future and His perfect judgments and the time that is coming ahead. This has all been revealed to us. What glorious gift He has given to us. And I know I haven't told all, and you could add many other things. The priesthood. No longer are they they're going to trust these people dressed in, in special robes and, and the, the temple and all the offerings. No, we have the finished work of Christ, and we have the priesthood, as Peter says, of all believers, each one of us, that has been saved by God's grace. Our approach to God, how is it? Uh, both boldness to the throne of grace. Um, the, our, that's being God's inheritance. What does that mean? He chose Israel for his inheritance. Not, that's not longer. Now it's us as his inheritance. And the fullness of his hope um, both for both Jew and Gentile, the relationship of the law and the battle we're in, and so many other things are revealed. God in his graciousness have they revealed them to us. But why did we receive them? Because Christ died. But not only did he die, descend into the lower parts of the earth, he was buried, but he rose again. He's triumphant. And he took some captives and gave them unto us. Gifts for, for man. We've received them. We have them. We have our New Testament. We, may we prize it. May we... May we look into it intently and let us be understand we have the Apostles' doctrine in our hands. All that God intended us to know, we have it in our hands. Let it mold us and direct us in all our gatherings and all that we preach. We have great, a great understanding given to us from the risen Lord the glorified, uh, conquering Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's speak to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee for our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. And we rejoice in our own salvation, thinking of what He did for us on Calvary, how He shed His precious blood. And we can say, the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me, we can realize that he bore my sins in his own body on the tree. We can rejoice in that. But he has not left us alone. He has not left us to fend and try to figure out things for ourselves and what should we do. We thank thee for the greatness of thy working in a Paul and a Peter and a John and, and others of these apostles. And by thy spirit guiding them to write what we have in what we call the New Testament, so we might understand with clarity the greatness of this new work that thou hast done, not known in the past, but it's a great work, and thou art bringing us to the fullness of the understanding uh, of the truth that we be united in the truth uh, that thou hast given to us and have one faith and understand it and be obedient unto thyself as well. Grant us willingness to learn thy word. Grant us willingness to obey thy word. And we pray that we might prize thy word and thine instructions 
and glorify our Savior with our lives. Bless and keep each one of us. And we thank Thee for bringing us here in safety. We look to Thee for safety and health and for our strength. We are dependent on Thee in every way. And we know, like Paul, we are but the least of all saints. And yet, anything that we can be is Thy gift unto us. We do give Thee thanks in our Savior's worthy name. Amen. I probably should have mentioned our part in it as little joints, and everyone has been given a gift as well. If someone else doesn't have a, a hymn, I, I have something. It might not be really a lot related to what I've been preaching on. Um, I think it's 249. Sovereign grace or sin abounding, ransom souls the tidings swell. Tis the deep that knows no sounding, who its breadth or length can tell. On his glory, in its glories, let my soul forever dwell. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus, long ere time its race began. To his name eternal praises, oh what wonders love hath done. One with Jesus by eternal union one. Number 249. Sovereign grace or sin abounding, ransom souls the tidings well is a depth that no 